Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Lathe Skills, a series of quick videos on getting started in machining. This is episode 19, Measurements. You know, up until now, if you've been following this series, we haven't really needed a whole lot of precision. We've been using some basic uh, lathe techniques, but uh, we haven't really needed to measure much. So that all changes right now. We're going to get precise and we're going to learn to measure things the machinist way. Now, if you're coming into machining from DIY or home renovation or carpentry, you know, you'll be familiar with this guy, the Humboldt tape measure, and it has a vital role in the machine shop as well. Okay, okay, it's got one other purpose. Now, if you've spent any time browsing industrial supply catalogs, and I know that you have, you know that there are seemingly infinite ways and means of measuring things in the machine shop. But uh, luckily for us beginners and for the home gamers, there's really only three major categories of things that you need to measure and uh, a set of simple tools that you need to do those jobs. So uh, those three categories are outside dimensions, inside dimensions, and depths. So uh, this is kind of like the starter set that you're going to need once you start caring about getting precise. And uh, some of these you will know, maybe some you won't, but uh, let's go through each of these guys in some detail. But real quick before we dive into all the fancy tools, let's take a quick look at the Humble Machinist scale, which was not in my previous display. And uh, these guys are inexpensive, very useful, and you should have lots of these lying around your shop at all times. Uh, what separates them from a basic ruler is that in addition to being precision made, uh, they also have inches marked in tenths and hundredths on the back, which is uh, much more generally useful for the machine shop than uh, the typical, you know, sixteenths or eighths that you'll find on a tape measure or, uh, or other types of traditional measuring instruments. Uh, and of course you can get these in metric as well. Let's use this machinist scale to talk about units a little bit, because we haven't done that really yet in this series, and it's now going to start to matter a whole lot. So this is a uh, standard uh, imperial machinist scale, and it's marked primarily in inches. If you're using a metric machinist scale, it's going to be marked primarily in centimeters. And then these smaller units here are tenths of an inch, so 0.1 inch, 0.2 inch, 0.3 inch, 10 of those in an inch. And then these teeny tiny marks up here are hundredths of an inch, so there's a hundred of those in a single inch. Now this word tenths is a little problematic in the imperial machine shop and this is something that trips up a lot of beginners. So while this guy right here is 0.6 inches and it would be technically correct to call that six tenths of an inch, typically you'll hear this described as 600 thousandths instead. And uh, you're typically going to be working in thousandths of an inch in the imperial machine shop. And uh, the challenges come in when you want to start doing more precise work and you want to subdivide a thousandth of an inch what do you end up with? You end up with a ten thousandth of an inch, but saying ten thousandths all the time is very difficult. And so imperial machinists shorten that to tenths. So when you hear an imperial machinist talk about tenths, nine times out of 10, they're not talking about these tenths, they're talking about ten thousandths of an inch. So uh, that's incredibly confusing for beginners, but uh, to keep this consistent, uh, when I say tenths, I will always be talking about ten thousandths of an inch because that is uh, by far the most common way people mean that. And I will never use tenths in this definition of the term. I will always refer to this as six hundred thousandths or six hundred thou. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Now, if you're working in metric, uh, your smaller divisions are going to be millimeters. And when you get into more precise work, you're going to be mostly working in uh, decimals of millimeters. So 0.1 millimeters, 0.2 millimeters, and so on. And uh, a quick uh, mental conversion or calibration, if you like, is that one millimeter is about 40 thousandths. So if you hear me taking a 20 thou you know, depth of cut on a facing pass, you know that that's half a millimeter for the metric folks. So these, of course, are calipers, and they give you your first order approximation of a dimension in the machine shop. Uh, you've uh, no doubt seen these. You probably have some already if you're watching this channel and you've made it this far. If, uh, like a lot of my viewers, you're coming into machining from, say, 3D printing, you probably have one of these guys. You know, this is your typical Amazon, whatever, $10 digital caliper. And uh, these guys are tempting because they're digital and, you know, they look all high tech and stuff. But, uh, the, well, the problem with these guys and uh, the reason I'm going to uh, have you reject these out of hand is because of that. The batteries in these things are always dead when you need them. 
Now, there are high quality digital calipers from you know reputable machine tool makers like Minutoyo and Sterrett and so on, and those are a different ball game. They manage their power, but uh, these uh, cheapos from Amazon don't. So uh, yeah, save your money unless you want to spend the rest of your life buying batteries and keeping 20 of them on hand because of course this will always be dead every single time you need it. Now compare that to this guy, which is your basic mechanical dial caliper, and this guy is powered by Cheetos hopes and dreams and those things never run out. So uh, this guy is my go-to. And here's a variation that measures in both imperial and metric. And uh, not only is this guy good for measuring metric, but uh, it's also good as kind of a slide rule. So I use it for unit conversion. If uh, you know I need to know what uh, 10 millimeters is in inches, I can dial in 10 millimeters and then just read it on the other dial and uh, instant conversion. So uh, know that these guys exist as well. But uh, let's take a look at this guy in depth. This is an animal with many, many tricks. And uh, there's actually a lot of parts on here that you don't often see explained. So I'm gonna go through all of them in detail. Now, the cool thing about uh, the caliper is that it can do every single type of measurement that we covered before, inside dimensions, outside dimensions, and depths. It, uh, it does them all with varying amounts of precision, and uh, the precision of each of those is gonna be lower than more sophisticated tools that we'll look at next. But once again, as a first order approximation, uh, the caliper is your friend. The main superpower of the caliper is speed. It's extremely fast to read. So this is an imperial caliper, it's marked in inches. So these markings here are each 100 thousandths, and then the dial is marked in thousandths, and one lap of the dial is 100 thousandths. And so one lap of the dial is one trip from a whole number here on the scale. So I'm at 500 there, zero there. So you can see as I travel along, and when I hit the six, that's 600, and then that guy hits zero, and we are at 600. So very, very quick to read. Uh, you typically don't uh, get a lot of read errors uh, with this tool compared to some other tools that require more brain power to read them. It's much easier to make a mistake in the reading, uh, but these guys are uh, more difficult to get an accurate measurement because of all of, of the uh, flex and things that we'll talk about here shortly. The trick with mechanical measuring instruments like this is that frequently each level of precision requires a different mechanism to measure it or indicate it, and all of those mechanisms are compounded into one tool. And so to read the measurement, we need to start with the highest and add each subsequent level until we get to the final measurement. So in this case, our major unit is one inch. So we've got that. Plus we have 100 thou here. So we've got 1.1 inches. And then over here on the dial, we've got an additional 20, one, two, three thousandths marked here. So this brings our total to 1.123 inches. So uh, this process of adding up all of the decimal places of the final measurement uh, is the skill upon which all these tools are based. So uh, you can start learning that skill right now with the mechanical caliper. Now that all sounds straightforward and uh, it is in theory, but like everything in machining, in addition to the theory, there is a, uh, an element of, of, of physical skill as well and measuring is no different. So uh, it's, it's not enough to just slap the caliper on here and read the, read the reading and you're done. Uh, you have to apply the caliper correctly to the work in order to get accurate results. So before we actually take a measurement, you want to check your zero. And uh, so you collapse this guy all the way down, and you can see that actually we didn't end up at zero. We ended up at 11 and change. So uh, that brings us to the first rule of any measuring, which is cleanliness. So uh, you always want to make sure those jaws are nice and clean, and the work that you're going to be measuring is clean as well. And uh, now if we check our zero, can see that we are right on. So uh, uh, often a chip that you can't even see or a speck of dust in those jaws is going to throw this measurement off. So uh, uh, always make sure that your jaws and your work are clean. And uh, if everything is clean and this still isn't reading zero, you can use this little knob here and you can rotate this bezel a little bit to zero that guy out. The second element of technique uh, to be mindful of is the angle of the jaws relative to the work. The jaws have to be square to the surface of the work in order to get a correct measurement. So I might do something like this, and you can see that I have what I think might be a measurement there, but my jaws aren't square, and if I square them up, you can see that, oh, actually, that rate reading was quite a bit too high. So uh, 
making sure that your jaws are square is important. And this can be especially tricky with calipers because the jaws are thin, it can be more difficult than other tools to know if you're square. You know, this uh, might feel square, but you can see that, you know, it's very easy to get a lot of variation in uh, a caliper reading. So uh, if in doubt, you know, you can wiggle it around and the smallest reading that you, that you get will be the square one. And the third element of technique is pressure. The jaws have to be squeezing just the right amount for the reading to be precise. You want those jaws touching the surface but not squeezing and uh, that's easy to say but you know when you're contorted up around the work on the lathe it's it's tempting to for example use these guys back here to squeeze the jaws up against the surface but if you use if you use that technique it's very easy to distort your reading by a couple of thou uh, so that's what this little thumb wheel here is really for by using this guy to apply your pressure with the jaws this is applying pressure straight up through the rigid portion of the jaws and it will keep you from accidentally distorting this whole area here, which is easy to do if you squeeze in other parts of the tool. So this thumb wheel here is your friend for getting an accurate reading. Now in the real world, you're often taking readings on a machine tool in some awkward setup and you might be forced to be holding this tool in a position where you can't read the dial or there might be parallax uh, error because you're looking at the dial at a weird angle. And so that's where this little guy, guy comes in, I can apply the caliper to the work using proper technique with squeezing an angle and all those things. And then I can come down here and lock that guy down, remove the caliper, and there's my reading right there. So uh, this little lock here is very useful for holding the reading while you extract your body parts from whatever crazy angle you needed to get that reading. But wait, these jaws have a few more tricks. One common problem with measuring flat stock that you've just machined is that there's often gonna be a burr on the edge of that surface. And if you try to go in here and measure it like so, you're gonna be measuring the thickness of that burr in addition to your material. So these jaws have these little recesses at the base. And so you can use those guys to get in and be clear of that burr. That burr, if there is one, is now gonna be in that recessed area of the jaw and won't influence your measurement. And you'll also find this thin area at the ends of the jaws, which is useful for getting into tight spaces. If I needed to measure this uh, shoulder right here, I can go in with the thin part of these jaws and I'm now clear of any, of any burr that might be on the end of the part and clear of any fillet that might be at the base of the part and I can get this measurement. Now the risk with uh, this technique is that these thin areas of the jaws are even more susceptible to those kinds of angle errors that we talked about. So it's, it is more challenging to get uh, this part of the jaw square to the work. So be mindful of that. So when it comes time to measure interior dimensions now, we've got these little jaws on the back. And uh, these guys are, once again, uh, uh, a good approximation, but uh, don't rely on them when precision really counts. Uh, the main issue with these little jaws uh, for interior dimensions, especially on round bores, is that uh, it's very easy to get misaligned. So as you can see here, it's, you know, I can get a lot of different readings depending on exactly how I hold these two things relative to each other. So uh, it's important to, uh, to get uh, the, the jaws correctly seated on the surfaces of that bore. And uh, when in doubt, you know, you can kind of feel around until uh, whatever the largest reading you can get is gonna be the correct one because that's gonna be when your jaws are uh, most parallel to those surfaces in there. And this is a 500 thou bore, so that's gonna be our reading right there. And recall that I said that the caliper allows us to measure all three categories of things. And the third one is depth. The caliper actually has two convenient ways to do that. There's this little pigtail down here and then there's the lesser known shoulder up here for measuring depth. So for depth, you simply stick the pigtail down in the thing that you wanna measure the depth of, and you collapse the caliper until that shoulder seats down like so. And there's our reading right there. Now, this is probably the least precise thing that the caliper can do because uh, it does have, uh, you know, once again, a lot of wiggle room for error uh, with angle and, and other issues. And uh, so, yeah, uh, treat this guy as, as, a, as a good approximation, uh, gets you in the ballpark. And then the shoulder method just involves placing top of the caliper on there and rolling it down until it touches our shoulder like so. And there's our reading right there. Uh, this method is, uh, I think, easier to get uh, precision out of a caliper, but uh, it, uh, it does take up a lot more space. There often isn't room to do this, but uh, if, if possible, I like to use this method for measuring depth. Okay, but calipers are pretty boring. Every kid with a 3D printer has one of those. Now the micrometer, that's some sexy machining action right there. Nothing says machine shop 
like a set of micrometers. So when you're done playing with the toys and you need to get serious with your measurements, the micrometer is where it's at. Now, these guys come in sets because the, uh, the mechanism on the micrometers are all the same thing. They all have a range. So these are imperial micrometers, so they, they measure a range of one inch, and then the frame of the micrometer is your approximation. So this is, you know, a zero to one inch and a one to two and a two to three inch. So if you've got, you know, a part that you know is between two and three inches in diameter, this frame right here is your approximation of that measurement. And then the final measurement is dialed in with the barrel of the device. So we'll start with the baby one inch because this is the easiest to understand. Now the entire measuring range of this device is one inch. So already we're in precision town, population U. And uh, so keep that in mind when you're looking at these numbers. Now, these are uh, imperial micrometers that I'm showing you, but uh, metric ones work the same way, but the units will be a little different. So uh, bear with me here if you are metric folks. Now, on an imperial micrometer, these large numbers on the barrels are each 100 thousandths. So this is, you know, 0, 100 thou, 200 thou, 300 thou. And then just like on the caliper, the distance between the small markings is one trip around the dial. In this case, the dial is arranged around a barrel. So one trip around this barrel is one trip between two of these markings. Okay, that's easy, but where things get weird with a micrometer is that the distance between these small lines here is 25. And uh, that's unfortunate, but that's just how it is. So if I go one full lap of this barrel off of that four, I'm now at the next tick right there, and you see this number right here is 24. So this is 424 thousandths, but this is 425 thousandths. And you can see that I'm right on the next small line past the big four there. So each of these small ticks down here is 25 thousandths. Now the price we pay for all this precision is extra math. As you can see on this reading, we've got 400 plus three ticks is 75, and we're on 17, so we've got 400 plus 75 plus 17, that's 492 thousandths. So you can see how uh, pretty soon you're adding weird numbers like 75 and 17 in your head, and it's easy to make mistakes. So uh, don't be afraid to uh, take your time, redo a measurement, make sure you're doing things correctly when reading a micrometer. Now for the larger micrometers, they work the same way, except that you have to add the size of the frame because this is our lowest precision. So you start once again by adding this guy and then adding all of the decimal places after that. So uh, uh, in this case, this is a two to three micrometer. So we start with two inches plus the reading on the body plus the reading on the barrel. So uh, this is going to be two plus 400 thousandths, so this is 2.4 inches. Now we've been looking at basic thousandths micrometers, but there are micrometers that go one step further into the 10 thousandths range, or tenths as us rushed machinists will refer to them. So the process for reading a micrometer like this is the same, but we go one step further. So once again, starting with our lowest precision, which is the frame, we get zero from that, and then we move to the body, which gives us 400 thou, and then we move to the barrel, which gives us zero. So far, so good. But uh, now there's one step further we can go. If you turn this guy up top here, you can see there's a little tiny vernier scale up here. And this gives you your 10 thousandths. Now, vernier scales can be a little bit intimidating for new folks, uh, perhaps because the math behind them is pretty sophisticated and clever. But uh, the way you use them is actually very, very simple, if a little unintuitive. So what you're doing is you're working your way around here and you're looking for a pair of lines here that line up the best. And it doesn't matter what the numbers over here are. These numbers are now irrelevant when we go to read the Vernier scale. What they're doing is they're just reusing this set of lines to map onto this Vernier scale here that's printed on the body of the micrometer. So you work your way around until you find two sets of lines that line up the best and it's gonna be this pair of lines right here, and then you take your reading off the scale here. This number over here, this four, is irrelevant. All that matters here is that this line happens to line up with this line, and there's a five right there, and that five is our 10,000th reading. So this is five ten thousandths. And as we work our way around here, you can see that all the other pairs of lines are mismatched. So there will always only be one pair of lines that match up. 
here when we come back to the main reading you can see that sure enough we are halfway between these two markings here and these markings are thousandths so halfway between those is five ten thousandths all right over to technique now and it's very similar to the caliper we have the same three rules that we need to worry about so we're going to start by thinking about positioning once again being clear of any uh, burrs that might be on the end of the part and uh, with the micrometer because we have a small round surface uh, which we call the anvil that is our measuring surface instead of those long jaws when measuring on round parts you need to make sure that you're you know, roughly centered on the uh, uh, on the widest part of the stock, and uh, you know, as long as the uh, the widest part is somewhere on your anvils, that's all that you need. Just make sure that you're not you know measuring down here. Now, next is alignment, and with the micrometer, you're basically going to be doing that by feel. When the micrometer is misaligned, you'll feel it, and so generally, as you close in on the anvils touching the work, you can kind of wiggle this guy around, and you'll feel when the anvils square up. Now for tension, you want those anvils to be firmly planted on the surfaces, but not squeezing anything. So you don't wanna crank down on this guy like you would with a C-clamp. If you do that, you're gonna damage uh, the delicate mechanism in here. This is a precision instrument, so treat it with respect. Now, getting that feel just right can take a little bit of practice, but for beginners, uh, you can get a micrometer like this that has a ratcheting thumb wheel on the back. And this guy back here works like a torque wrench. So it will click when the amount of tension is just right. So make sure you're wiggling to get your alignment. Once the anvils are firmly planted, keep turning until you get one click on that ratchet, and now the tension is exactly correct. And recall that the caliper had that uh, thumb wheel on it for tightening it so that you don't distort the measurement as you remove it. And the micrometer has the same thing. It's got this little guy right here, so we can tighten that guy. And now we can remove this from the work knowing that we haven't distorted that measurement. And then hopefully from the previous segment, you learned how to read this guy. So this is 700 plus two marks of 25. So that's 750. And we're a little above the zero. So we're 750 and change. But let's step up to the fancy guy and see what that change is beyond 750. So once again, I'm gonna come down here, ratchet that guy, lock it. And that change turns out to be finding my lines that line up the best. It's going to be these guys right here, and that is six tenths. So our final reading is 750 and six tenths. Before we leave micrometers, let's talk care and feeding a little bit. These are precision instruments. They're expensive, and they need to be treated with love and respect. So first, if you need to move the anvil a large distance, don't hold it by the barrel and swing the frame around. Instead, uh, just put it on your arm and just roll it like that. That'll let you move a large distance in a short amount of time in a way that won't damage the mechanism. Now the anvils on your micrometer are very, very important. You can see from how shiny they are what an amazing finish they have on them. They really are like a mirror. And uh, the anvils are very, very hard and have a very, very high quality finish on them. And uh, you have to take very good care of these guys. Don't ever let anything abrasive or sharp touch them. Don't let them get chipped or dinged. Don't drop them on anything. Uh, your micrometer is only as good as these anvils, so take extra good care of them. And recall on the caliper that we could adjust the zero point. Well, you can do that on the micrometer as well. So typically what you do is you close it all the way up, once again, making sure that the, uh, the anvils are clean. And uh, typically there will be a little spanner slot like that, and then it will come with this little wrench that you can use to adjust the zero on that guy. Now the zeroing method is a little different for every micrometer, so check your instructions for the proper method. But then how do you do that on the bigger guys? Because, well, they can't close all the way up. The anvil isn't that long, right? Because again, they only measure a range of one inch regardless of the size of the micrometer. Well. That's where these guys come in, and these are your standards. And uh, when you get them, they'll have these blobs of wax on the end to protect them because they have precision anvils on them, just like the micrometer itself. But the way these work is you clean the wax off of there and you stick it in that micrometer and that will take up the extra inch or two inches that is defined by the frame and allow you to adjust the zero on your anvil. But I'm afraid that is all the time we have for this video. So we will finish up with our measuring tools next time. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider supporting me on Patreon, and we will see you then.